Thank you. Thank you, everybody, those of you who are still awake. Um, I want to thank my partner in crime, Mark Tooley, for putting me in the absolute worst slot of the day. Thank you, Mark. Uh, no, seriously, it's been, a, it's been a joy to work with Mark. We uh, dreamed up this idea a few years back, and here it is. And I'm happy to say that uh, thanks to adding new staff and rearranging some things, Providence is doing better than ever. We've, we're getting more traffic by far online, um, I think much better quality in our articles. So we thank those of you who've been sticking it out with us over the years as we uh, get better and uh, find our audience. And I hope you're telling others about, uh, about what we're doing. I think, as Walter said this morning, it's really important. So I'm Robert Nicholson. Uh, I'm going to talk. If you know anything about me, you know that I'm going to talk about the Middle East, because that's what I do. Um, and I'm going to talk about American frustrations in the Middle East and hopefully how to overcome them, or at least start to overcome them. Uh, I want to start with a story of uh, a bus full of Coptic Christian pilgrims who were headed from the town of Sohag to the city of Elminia in Egypt when, you know, as they went about their business going to the St. Samuel Monastery there in Elminia, they were attacked mercilessly by a still unknown group of terrorists. Seven people died, 14 people were wounded. On the bus was a family bringing their small child to be baptized at that monastery. And that wasn't... Uh, Ten years ago, that was this morning when you slept, um, and this is the second time it, it, this has happened in that exact place in one year, um, and these attacks are happening all the time in Egypt and beyond. I was just in Egypt a few weeks ago meeting with cops, meeting with Muslims, talking to people about the state of society there, and needless to say, it's really, really bad. It was actually worse than I expected, and uh, it just reminded me that there is a tremendous amount of frustration uh, for me, and not just for me, but for other Christians, other Americans, about this part of the world. And I do think, you know, people always ask me, who cares, the Middle East, why not uh, Southeast Asia? Um, I think all regions of the world are important. Providence is dedicated to that idea. But for me, the Middle East, any question involving the Middle East uh, has some kind of Christian element to it, of course, because our faith comes from there. Our faith is not American or European. It's actually a Middle Eastern religion. Um, there are also all kinds of religious dimensions when it comes to the Middle East. The three major uh, Abrahamic religions were born there for a reason. It's a very religious part of the world. If you're a religious person, you know that there is an element of religion that needs to be taken into account. And I'm going to come back to that. There's also, as I mentioned, tremendous persecution of Christians, but not just Christians, religious and ethnic minorities of all kinds including uh, Muslims who don't toe the line of any particular group or society. And of course, if you're a Christian and you care about the gospel, it is one of the most, by far, one of the most gospel poor parts of the world. So there are many reasons to care about this region, and I think that overcoming these frustrations is a big part of engaging it uh, more effectively. So we are... Uh, I think, you know, for me, the, the pretext for this is the 100-year anniversary of Western engagement with the Middle East. Of course, we've engaged with the Middle East a lot longer than that, but World War I ended in the Middle East 100 years ago, almost exactly on October 30th, 1918, when Ottoman and British officials signed the Armistice of Mudros uh, aboard the HMS Agamemnon in the middle of the Aegean Sea. And while it was the final curtain for the Ottomans, the Sultanate would collapse in 1922, the caliphate collapsed in 1924. It was just the beginning for Western powers, who, apologize for that, who would spend the next 100 years entangled in Middle Eastern affairs right up until today. And it's been a frustrating century, to say the least. There's another anniversary that is the pretext of this talk, and that is the 15-year anniversary of the US invasion of Iraq that Mary talked about and has been referenced here and there. And what I would say, um, this is my opinion, is that it was the grandest and most disastrous American initiative in the region to date. It was a set piece in good intentions gone awry. It led to the death of nearly 5,000 coalition forces, over 100,000 Iraqis. It created a power vacuum in the center of the region that was exploited by Iran. It inspired and trained a new generation of Muslim terrorists, some of whom went on to create the Islamic State of Iraq and Syria, or ISIS. It provoked a new era of sectarianism between Sunnis and Shis, uh, 
left Christians, Yazidis, and other minorities without protection, convinced hundreds of millions of Middle Easterners that we'll stop at nothing to interfere in their uh, affairs under the pretext of fighting terrorism and spreading freedom, and I think most importantly for this talk, it convinced many Americans, liberals and conservatives, that US, U.S. policymakers are either devious or incompetent and should leave the region entirely. Um, and here I'm going to bring in uh, a little snippet from my favorite book, uh, The Heart of Darkness by Joseph Conrad. And it's really just because I like Conrad and want to quote him. I try to work him into many different things. I would say Conrad is a great realist. Um, and if you read his writing, you know what I mean. So it's a great... Uh, I don't know if any of you have read the book, you may know what I'm talking about, but there's a great moment when the main character is headed down to Africa. He's going to pilot a riverboat uh, on the Congo, and the, and the whole story revolves around his trip there and his trip up the river and what he encounters, explores not only colonialism and imperialism uh, at the height of the British Empire, but also uh, human nature. It's a really, really great book, and it's really short, so I recommend it. But there's this great part when he's on the ship headed down from... Uh, from Europe to Africa, where he's sort of going along the coast of Western Africa, and there's this, there's this passage. And um, the main character says this. He says, for a, for a time I would feel I belonged still to a world of straightforward facts, but the feeling would not last long. Something would turn up to scare it away. Once, I remember, we came upon a man of war anchored off the coast. There wasn't even a shed there, and she was shelling the bush. It appears the French had one of their wars going on thereabouts. Her ensign dropped limp like a rag. The muzzles of this long six-inch gun stuck out all over the low hull. The greasy, slimy swell swung her up lazily and let her down, swaying her thin masts. In the empty immensity of earth, sky, and water, there, there she was, incomprehensible, firing into a continent. Pop would go one of the six-inch guns. A small flame would dart and vanish. A little white smoke would appear, a tiny projectile would give a feeble screech, and nothing happened. Nothing could happen. There was a touch of insanity in the proceeding, a sense of lugubrious drollery in the sight, and it was not dissipated by someone on board assuring me earnestly there was a camp of natives, he called them enemies, hidden out of sight somewhere. And this idea of firing into a continent, this sort of folly of trying to impact a part of the world that we really don't understand and where we don't seem to be very successful is kind of the theme or the lens through which I want to talk about this. And it's actually the, the title, the main title of my lecture is Firing uh, into a Continent. This feeling, this frustration, this thing like what are we doing in the Middle East, why are we not being effective, leads to lots of divisive policies and spasmodic actions. And I think there's no better illustration of that than Syria, and particularly President Trump's April missile attack on Bashar al-Assad's chemical weapons infrastructure. So lots of people, I'm sure you know them or you may be among them, had a problem with this apparent half measure. Some people wanted more action. They say you didn't go far enough. A missile strike, that's, that's just not sufficient. Other people wanted much less. And the sentiment that seemed the most common was either win the war or stay out of it. This concept of limited intervention, of doing something small to make a statement, to sort of mow the grass as it were, is really hard to grasp for us as Americans because we have trouble talking about limited anything. If we're going to fight, we want to win. And we don't want a technical knockout. We want the other guy splayed out on the floor. That's the only way we're going to fight. Um, and it's also hard to, to grasp because we're the most powerful state in the world, and we know that we have some kind of moral responsibility to secure that world against tyranny, or so we've been told. And this disparity, this disparity between our overwhelming power and our failure to achieve definitive victory is a source of major frustration for the American people. They ask, how can we be so strong? We're so strong. How, do we, how are we so strong and yet so impotent in places like Afghanistan, Iraq, and Syria? One president after another has tried to explain what we're doing in these places, but we never seem to win anywhere. And if we can't win, why are we still fighting? The American people want to know. Now, I should say, we haven't failed completely. And part of this talk is to point out that some of what I'm talking about is perception. There's a feeling of frustration that we never win. There's nothing good that we can accomplish in this part of the world. I think that's wrong, but it is for sure a feeling. Um, evidence that we haven't failed completely. So imperialism, the kind that Joseph Conrad knew so well. Ottoman imperialism uh, of the Arabs, European uh, colonialism. Uh, both of those have ended. 
They don't exist anymore. Middle Eastern states are independent, and there's many of them. Um, another anniversary this year, 1948. In 1948, the Jewish people, indigenous people of the Middle East who had been scattered for a long time, uh, became free and sovereign in their own homeland, and I don't think that should be taken for granted, especially in the days post-Pittsburgh. Life expectancy is up, literacy is up, energy reserves are flowing more or less as needed, uh, we've done a lot, the United States, the West, to aid ethnic and religious minorities, Christians, but also other groups uh, like Yazidis. There's also something that's rarely talked about, and that is the uh, decades-long, maybe century-long uh, project of Western scholars to understand and explore the history of the Middle East. Uh, I think it goes without saying that much of the past, when it comes to places like Egypt and Iraq, uh, in other places in the region would not be known were it not for the efforts of Western scholars who deciphered many of these dead languages and excavated these ancient cities. So we've done a lot. This is not a talk to say that we are terrible. In fact, I think it's the opposite. But there is still a frustration. And so you ask yourself, well, what is it? What is it that's so frustrating about this part of the world that seems to make it different from others? Um, the obvious answer is that this region, really for the last hundred years, since that day on the Agamemnon, the Middle East is continually un un unstable. It has not reached any kind of equilibrium since those days, since the collapse of the Ottoman Empire. There have been constant wars, constant coups, revolutions. There never seems to be a baseline toward which we're returning. If you ask yourself, is the situation better in the Middle East now than it was in 1922 or 1918 or 1924, the jury's out. I don't know, is it better? It depends on how you're, you're measuring it. If stability is important to you, if order is important, I would say that by and large, it's actually not uh, been so successful. So instability, this constant feeling of instability, this region won't calm down, that's one source of frustration. Another is this sort of disproportionate hostility that comes out of the Middle East in our direction. And look, we weren't actually with Conrad. We weren't colonizing on behalf of the British or the French or anyone else. Uh, we came late to the game. And so there is a feeling that, you know, what do you hate us so much for? We didn't even try to colonize. We had nothing to do with the British mandate system or any of the machinations that happened uh, in those early years of the 20th century. Nevertheless, there is this tremendous amount of hostility. Somehow, people like Vladimir Putin escaped that hostility. I personally think it's because People know he just doesn't care. You can hate him if you want, but he's going to do what he wants to do. People know that we do care, and so they attack us. We get attacked because we do too much in the region, we're meddling in all these different affairs, or we get attacked because we don't do enough. Why didn't you get involved in this hotspot? Why aren't you doing more in Syria? Why aren't you doing more in Yemen? So hostility, that's the second reason. I would say, and this relates to the first point of instability, there's this failure to evolve um, that we see in the Middle East. And despite, there has been 12 consecutive years, at least as measured by Freedom House, of decline in global freedom. Um, nevertheless, liberal democracy, certainly in the last 100 years, has spread to many parts of the world. So, certainly many parts that we wouldn't have thought 100 years ago that it would reach. Uh, there's a recent paper by our colleague Paul Miller who was up here just a few hours ago. He published it this summer in Washington Quarterly. He argues that liberal democracy is actually not unique to Western countries and it's fully compatible with non-Western societies. He cites a 2017 Freedom House report that found 64 non-Western countries that were either free or partly free and he sees that as a big achievement, uh, a, a counter argument to those who say, look, it's never going to happen outside of the West. But still, when it comes to the Middle East, only Israel and Tunisia are classified as free by that same uh, set of indicators. And only Jordan, Lebanon, and Morocco are partly free. Every other state is classified as unfree. The region has a problem. It's not moving in a systematic way, at least in the way that we would like it to move. Fourthly, and this goes to my, my opening uh, anecdote, there's something that I'm calling here a freedom asymmetry. So, even as we in the West are debating uh, Muslim refugees, whether they be from Syria or anywhere else, and, and why they should be allowed in, and how they should be granted equal rights, how they shouldn't be treated any differently than any other group, um, we know that the mirror image of that is that Christians in the Middle East are getting the exact opposite treatment. At best, they're living under 
Jim Crow status in most of these states. And at worst, things are happening like they happened this morning uh, in Egypt. And there's this feeling that it's just not fair. How is it that we are treating your people nice when they come here and you're not treating our people nice when they're there? It's freedom asymmetry. There's also all of these moral dilemmas that keep coming up and driving us crazy. And I think there's no better case study here than what happened just in the last few weeks with Saudi Arabia and Jamal Khashoggi. This feeling that, okay, we find a stable country in the Middle East, okay? They're not perfect, there's a lot of warts, but hey, it's better than nothing. What's the alternative? It's all relative when you're working in the Middle East about what's good and what's bad. But then things happen like the murder of this journalist and his dismemberment inside the embassy of a NATO country. And as an American, you're like, seriously? Like, can we, you know, et tu brute? Like, we can't find anyone who can behave in this part of the world. We want to be your ally. We want to work with you. Nevertheless, you're doing these things that are forcing us to have to do things about it. And all of these moral dilemmas that we, we, we um, face in all of these different countries, and there's many of them, I could list many, um, are deeply um, annoying to American people, but also to American policymakers. You can imagine if for the Trump administration trying to build up Mohammed bin Salman and saying that this is a reformer, things are, things are good, and then this happens, you're just slapping your forehead like, come on, people, like get your act together. Uh, there's, of course, the threat of terrorism. Um, it doesn't seem to be abating. We've been doing this now for almost two decades. It seems like terrorism is just as bad or even worse in some cases than it was back then. And lastly, there's this feeling like we can't leave. And I think part of that is related to what we know, consciously or unconsciously, about the Middle East, and that is locked up inside this part of the world. Uh, in a different way than in West Africa or Latin America, there are all of these religious forces. Um, and maybe the, the moving of the embassy to Jerusalem most captures that. This is a city that it's, it's intangible. You can't sort of, you can't box it. But we know, we all know, that whatever happens in that city sends shockwaves throughout the rest of the world, Christians, Jews, and Muslims. And there's this feeling that we can't just sort of leave this region to its own devices. It's not, it's not uh, you know, Northeast Asia. There's things that happen there, whether we like it or not, are going to affect us back here. And the last thing we want is sort of the dark forces of religion unleashed from that part of the world. And there are a number of factors that hold us back, even as we try to overcome these frustrations. The, the first one, and some of these I've kind of said already, um, there's this structural instability, failed and failing states. You know, Iraq is held up as something of, something of a success story. It's got some kind of democracy. But we know, if you pay attention to Iraqi politics, um, notwithstanding a few bright spots, it's, it's a real mess. Lebanon, one of the few other stable countries in the Middle East, still deeply problematic. This, this failure for these states to come to some sort of political equilibrium, to have some uh, approximation of order and justice uh, is really holding back our Mideast policy. There's, of course, also a number of rivals who are seeking to exploit the regional instability for their own ends, of course, Russia being the first one of that. At this point, I think it's fair to say that Bashar al-Assad has won in Syria and that the Russians are probably going to stay, and the Iranians, another actor that does not have our best interests in mind, will also stay. We, as America, have been basically sidelined, and that's the good news is Syria, the Syrian civil war seems to be winding down. The bad news is uh, the vacuum that was left by our leadership has been filled by what, what I think, and I think what many think, is a less well-intentioned actor. There's also another factor that holds us back is uh, religion and the discussion about religion. So we know, it's, it's, it's saying the obvious, that a big part of the problem in the Middle East has to do with those Muslims who are interpreting their religion in a violent, radical, extreme way. Describe it the way that you want. But it's very difficult for a secular American administration to talk in those terms. Um, we know there are good Muslims and bad, but how do you discern between the one and the other? How do you even talk, how do you even have the conversation about uh, the way that Islam contributes or certain interpretations of Islam contribute to what's happening in the Middle East uh, as a secular government. How do you do that? And how do you address the elephant in the room in a way that doesn't alienate those Muslims who are on your side? That is, a, I think, a very important factor in this discussion. And it's related to another factor that holds us back, and I think it's, a, it's 
part of the problem of American foreign policy writ large is this kind of this problem of mirror imaging. You know, we project on the world what we think the world is. And much of what we think the world is or ought to be is based on who we are. So we think, you know, Iraq, when we invaded in 2003, we thought, look, this is a, this is a budding nation state full of proud Iraqis who just want to be free from tyranny so they can become like us. Well, it didn't exactly turn out that way. We thought people would vote according to some sort of political ideology or vote in the name of freedom, and it turns out they did what most people in the Middle East do, which is vote according to group identity. And now you have this sectarian problem in Iraq. But we, because we're a society that separates church and state and that uh, is a creedal republic that looks at all people as equal before the law, we don't see that. We have a big blind spot when it comes to the cultural dynamics of the region. And that's my last point is culture, just this dissonance between American or Western culture and Middle Eastern culture. They're not the same. You know, Bill Maher famously said, or uh, as you were, uh, Ben Affleck famously said on the Bill Maher show, you know, don't talk about Muslims that way. You know, they eat sandwiches just like we do. Um, it's true. They eat sandwiches like we do. Um, but they're different cultures. And I think if you pretend, like many Americans do, that there are no cultural differences. Humans are humans are human. Uh, you're going you're gonna to find yourself in a lot of uh, dead ends. So how to overcome frustrations. Now I should, I should uh, say that I don't, this, what follows is not the answer, but it's a couple of things that I've thought about uh, working in this space, being in the Middle East, being here, seeing the differences between the two. So the first sort of category of things is to adjust the domestic narrative, to basically manage expectations about our engagement with this part of the world. Um, we can't change the Middle East. Um, it's not, it's just not possible. We're, we're not, as Americans, even on our best day, we're not gonna change the Middle East. Um, even if it was possible, it's really not our responsibility or our place to try to. It's, you know, a region filled with hundreds of millions of people. They have their own culture, cultures, uh, different religions. It is up to the people who live there to uh, implement their values into their political systems as they want to. Uh, we will, or we should, where we can, promote our values. We must, actually. But we can't force people to accept them. As a Christian, you know, you can preach all the time. You can give sermons. You can give altar calls. You can uh, work with people. But at the end of the day, you can't force someone to believe in a set of principles. And I think the same goes, in a different way, for foreign policy and our promotion of values. At the end of the day, you should always promote your values, but you've got to realize that you are essentially limited in your ability to affect change. Um, and at the end of the day, whether we like this or not, other peoples may have other values and other ideas about how to organize their societies. Um, and this is where I think, even though it's been much slighted in recent months, the concept of sovereignty is so important. You know, we can't baptize societies in our image through sheer force of will. It's important that the American people understand that that's not what America has ever been about. Um, we are a pluralistic country internally, and I think we look at the world pluralistically, or at least we ought to, and we need to understand that these countries, we should shape them, we should try to influence them, but at the end of the day, they are sovereign states, and they're going to do what they're going to do. So understanding that first point, limited ability to affect change, I think you're able to move on to the next point, which is in talking the, in the domestic narrative, um, about limited intervention. And I said at the beginning, it's hard for us to think about limited intervention. You know, we were actually spoiled by World War II. You know, there we had this definitive victory over this obvious embodiment of evil. It's like the archetypal um, battle of Troy, you know. And even though we keep craving more battles of Troy, the world keeps giving us, you know, suicide bombers and, and man jammies. And that's really hard for us as Americans to deal with. We want, you know, apocalyptic struggle. If we're going to struggle, we want it to be apocalyptic. Um, and if it's not, then we're not interested. This idea of doing little things, of making little tweaks, something that Paul Miller mentioned, you know, this much of what foreign policy is is just sort of keeping the machine going. And I think there are all kinds of limited interventions we can make, not just military, just interventions in the Middle East uh, that can make a big difference. Lots of little things, pruning the garden, mowing the lawn, whatever you, you know, metaphor you choose. And it's important that as we speak to the American people, as policymakers, as executives speak to the American people, that they begin to wean people away, not just in the Middle East, but more broadly, away from this all or nothing mentality. That we have to either you know, 
take over Syria, defeat Bashar al-Assad, install a democracy, and win, or we just don't do anything. There's all kinds of interim steps that we can take. And I think, you know, one of the ways to talk about this is to talk about the American neighborhood. You know, we all, whether we like it or not, in the world, live in the world that America built, at least since the Second World War. And for us, we don't re really don't need to win in Syria or anywhere else because, in some sense, we've actually already won. Our foreign policy objective is really just to protect our interests and to preserve what we already have, to maintain, to not lose, to uh, eradicate or fill empty spaces that our rivals seek to exploit. Because the world is already organized according to American interests. It's in our interests to keep it that way, even if we have to spend a little time and money to do so. So uh, speaking to the American people, helping them understand that, look, the world is actually great. Um, at least if you care about American interests. We just need to do lots of little things to keep it that way. We don't need to feel like we're losing in Syria because um, we're not. So, uh, second point, how to overcome the frustrations, and it's sort of related, is be wary of hard power's ability to affect change. You know, it is very important that we have, I'm a military person, uh, I, of all people, believe it's really important for us to be using hard power to target terrorists, and to work with our allies to defeat the uh, material threat of terrorism, from weapons of mass destruction to uh, conventional weapons as well. Having said that, no one should be, be under the illusion that hard power is going to change the Middle East. And in fact, we need to be very aware that hard power often exacerbates a lot of the animosity against America. So this isn't to say that we should not use hard power. I think we should use it sparingly, prudently. But we need to be aware that that is not, that is not one of the tools in the toolbox if we care about uh, long-term engagement. I think thirdly, and relatedly to that, is we ramp up soft power in the Middle East. Some of the most effective things that we've ever done as Americans and as Westerners in the Middle East has been through soft power. Now, people are very skeptical of soft power. It doesn't mean anything. It doesn't do anything. It has no teeth. It has no legs. It has no hands, whatever. The, but the reality is we've done a lot. Some of the universities that we founded in the Middle East have been powerfully uh, impactful in the history of the region. I mentioned to you a lot of the scholarly initiatives. I think there's um, a lot to be said for public, in, public diplomacy uh, and information campaigns, something we don't spend nearly enough money on. Um, you know, the Middle East is a place of the spirit. The people in the Middle East, at the risk of stereotyping, tend to be religious people. They care about uh, ideas, they care about religion, they care about values. They may disagree on the values, depending on who they are, but they care about them. That is a conversation that Middle Easterners want to have. And I think we do far too little in the realm of communications um, when it comes to that. I know the president of the Middle East Broadcasting Network, Alberto Fernandez, one of the best Middle East uh, hands, I think, that, that I know. Uh, he's Cuban, speaks fluent Arabic, though. Um, just really somebody who's salty, as we say in the Marines. He's just been around for a long time, been in all these countries, spent lots of time on the ground, made lots of relationships. And this is a point that he makes a lot as the head of the uh, Middle East Broadcasting Network, is that we just need to do so much more in terms of communicating messages. Now, it's not a, you know, for if you're an American and you want that, you know, that, uh, that knockout, it doesn't, it's not quite satisfying, but if you do care about promoting values, it's going to come through persuasion and not through power. So public diplomacy, information campaigns, a world of initiatives that can happen in that space. Relatedly to that, educational initiatives, universities, scholarships, innovative learning, there's, all, there's a whole conversation about um, uh, education in this country and how it's changing with the advent of technology. I think there are many applications for bringing some of those technologies to the Middle East. Middle Easterners, one of the things, they may hate America all day long, but they would love a middle, uh, an American degree. Um, and I think that if there are ways for us to spread our values by working sort of with the interests of the people based on what they actually want and need, I think there's a lot of potential for change there. And doing, doing so, I should say, um, while very carefully thinking about what it is that we're teaching. You know, I was, like I said, I was in Egypt, I was in Cairo. The American University of Cairo is a great institution, but um, it may, you know, in some departments it may be more anti-American than the people who live in the neighborhood around the American University of Cairo. And that's unfortunate, to go to the American University and come out even more uh, charged with hostility toward this country I think uh, we need to be more intentional about what we're teaching. 
Um, I think we need to train the next generation. I went back and watched my Providence lecture from last year, and I spent some time on this then. Um, I won't mention it too much here, but when it comes to the people who are going to make policy, be diplomats, be involved in DOD and all these places, we need more people, especially young people, who know languages and culture. There are too many people I know who are trying to work on Middle Eastern, this is probably true in every area of the globe, but who are really into the, the space, really into the field, want to, you know, very well intentioned, but know virtually nothing about the space. Learn Arabic, learn Hebrew, learn Turkish, learn Persian. Like, you gotta, you gotta have some connection, you gotta have some context for your work, or you will be eaten alive. Trust me, I can tell you from personal experience. So training the next generation. Um, getting them away. IR theory doesn't work in the Middle East. Political science, I would argue, doesn't work in the Middle East. The Middle East, at least right now, is, uh, you know, the political regimes are the product of bargaining, arrangements, relationships. Nobody's trying to implement, you know, these very lofty ideas that are being taught in this august institution. They're just trying to make do, and I think that we need to recognize that and train our people, our people, uh, to go into that world knowing what it is that they're going to encounter. And part of that is something else that Alberto Fernandez mentions a lot, is we need to develop ground game. You know, he tells the story how he was the uh, chief diplomat. He was the ambassador in Sudan. He was the only Western chief of station who knew Arabic. The French, the British, the German, nobody knew Arabic. Meanwhile, the Russians, the Chinese, all of the other uh, uh, powers that were interested in the Sudan did know Arabic. And what he said is that these other groups had a tremendous ability because of that to have ground game, to be connected to people outside the four walls of the embassy. And I think if, we're, if we hope to affect change and to have a meaningful diplomacy, we need to be deploying people who actually know what they're talking about. All right, I'm winding down here. Um, the, the next, the last point is that we need to as a society, as a government, but especially as a society, to recognize and to think hard about the religious element that, invo that is involved with engaging the Middle East. I have a, a piece coming out in the next print edition of Providence where I, I propose the creation of a strategic working group of sort of very devout, believing, conservative Christians and very devout, believing, conservative Muslims as an informal uh, group that could think about, talk about, debate, agree, disagree, actually it's more important to disagree, about some of the big questions that are facing relations between our two societies. Uh, I think this body, if formed, uh, and if filled with honest people who are willing to have this, not interfaithy conversation, but uh, a much more kind of, uh, uh, um, what's the word I'm looking for, just truthful and honest and sometimes even a little acrimonious uh, conversation will will serve not only uh, an, in, uh, an important um, uh, intercultural multi-faith role, but it also could serve over time as an advisory body, as as a laboratory of sorts for policymakers and diplomats who are trying to think through these questions. One of the things that bothers me so much is that, as I said before, so much of people understand that it's a religious part of the world, but so much of the discussion takes place in these very politically correct terms. And you have very liberal Christians talking to very liberal Muslims and really no one speaking to the street. I think we need to uh, think about how to get the most believing parts of the two communities together because those are the two uh, uh, groups that have the most um, problems with each other. And you can see that in data. American uh, Christians, believing Christians of different denominations have very low opinions of, of Muslims and, and vice versa. That's something that I think that we can uh, begin to work on. It'll take a long time, as all of these things do, but right now I don't see anybody doing it uh, very effectively. Having the believers conversation about religion in Western Middle East relations. And I think, and that sort of comes to my last point, my last, last point, that this point of, uh, I said, freedom asymmetry, there's also some kind of spiritual asymmetry. So here we are, a secular country that's becoming increasingly secular, I should add, um, at least as measured by survey research, and here we are engaging what is possibly the most religious part of the world. And there's a dissonance there. There's a, there's a, there's a, we're talking past each other. It's very hard for us as a secular society to engage a number of very devout societies. Um, this whole kind of rational actor approach that we take doesn't always hold in the Middle East. Sometimes people do things that are 
you know, what others would describe as irrational. They do it because of faith. And I think we as Christians, of all people, understand that, look, there are some things that really aren't in our interest to do as, as Christians, but we do them anyway because we know that we're obligated to do it, we have a religious duty to do it. And I think that, you know, at least half of the problem in, in Western uh, Middle East relations, it's not just about rising Islamism over there, it's about declining Christianism back here. And I think there's a lot that we need to do to uh, shore up the foundations of our own civilization. Rather than trying to fix the Middle East or fix the Islamic world, we actually think about maybe there's a problem in the Western world. And maybe you know, Christianity in its journey westward out of the Middle East kind of lost some of its native sensibilities uh, about what's most important in the world, about the transcendent. And I think that even if we focused only on that, even if we only focused on reconnecting uh, the Western world and, and Americans in particular, especially in the next generation, to the roots of their faith, to the Middle Eastern roots of their faith, uh, I think that we will have already gone a long way toward improving relations between East and West because at least we're talking in some of the same language. Uh, so fix ourselves. Uh, that's, that's my final point. So I don't know if I'm on time here. Uh, Mark will, will tell you how much time you have for questions, but that concludes my remarks. Thank you for listening. Three. Wow, I was, I was on time. Rob, I hope you knew I was going to ask you a question. But your last no point fed right into my question, actually, which is, um, sorry, don't you think there's a, I have, I have two questions, sorry. Um, the first is, don't you think there's a certain sense of irony that at the same time we're promoting American values of democracy, there's a sense that the project at home has failed? And that's what this issue of Providence is about. And I really buy the argument of Deneen's book, um, The End of Liberalism. So maybe you don't, but that's a different, I mean, that's a different topic. But it's like, why would, why would the Muslim world sign up for a project that sanitizes the public square of all religious discourse? Why would the Muslim world sign up for this project that has led to, to um, the marginalization of religious discourse? I mean, um, and the sort of rise to um, partisan, um, you know, part party politics and all this stuff. Um, it seems like they're signing up for like this medicine that is killing patients as it goes. And you, I'm, I mean, that's just a metaphor. Yeah. Um, that's one question. The other question is, you, you, <laughs> you talk about how like sort of imperialism has ended. And I think on like the hard power sense it has. But um, I'm, I read uh, Edward Said's Orientalism, and he talks about how, and I really like how you brought up Conrad, because he talks about understanding this world. And that's what uh, Said critiques. He talks about how the West tries to categorize and understand and sort of put the, the Oriental, the East, into this box in order to, to gain power over them and to diagnose them and to give them their medicine. And I sense that, like, how is, that diff how is what you're saying different than that? Yeah. Um, Okay, so the first question I kind of answered. I mean, I think, um, I, look, Philos Project, you know, because you came through our program. Um, it's <laughs> a big part of was positive Christian engagement in the Middle East, which is our um, catch phrase or our tagline. It starts with reconnecting Christian to their, Christians to their Middle Eastern origins, helping them understand what is the spiritual connection between these two parts of the world. I think you're right. And let me tell you, there's nothing more absurd and demoralizing than watching American politics from abroad. I do it. I'm, I've been abroad many times just this year alone. Just the Twitter, the, I mean, you're just, it's baffling. Like, I, know, I kind of know what's going on, but when I'm there, I put myself in other people's shoes. Nobody wants to take that medicine, right? And, and the accusation, certainly in the conservative Muslim world, is that, look, you, you go Western, like, you become godless. You, suddenly your, girl, your, your daughter is wearing little tiny skirts, and, like, this is the... This is, the, um, this is the argument. I actually, as a conservative Christian, I get it. I actually, when I read what Osama bin Laden and Sayyid Qutb and some of these people have written, I am just I'm like, yeah, no, I, I totally get that. Um, so I do think there's, there's it's, it's, a, it's a Western problem. Uh, and uh, Charles Malik, who is a Lebanese philosopher and diplomat, who's probably my favorite thinker, somebody who lived on the seam line between East and West, you know, being from Lebanon, as a Christian, Orthodox Christian, but you know, fluent in Arabic, very much part of his society. Um, he, he sort of pointed out this weird paradox where the West, you know, what makes the West great is its sort of lofty spiritual ideas about the individual, about God, about, and yet he says what's most ironic uh, 
is that the West doesn't use any of that in its engagement with the world. It relies on all of these other things, you know, uh, economic interests, et cetera. So I think uh, there's a big, the problem here is uh, the U.S. government can't really, it's not going to be religious. It shouldn't be. I don't want it to be. But what the U.S. government needs to do, and this is what I say in this, this Providence piece that's coming out, is it needs to kind of make space, uh, provide funding, um, or just enable people in civil society and, and particularly in the religious world to be more engaged in this topic and seek their help uh, and stop doing it on their own. So that's the first thing. Um, how, how is what I'm saying different from Saeed? I'm saying these countries, look, I'm actually saying the exact opposite. I'm saying that these countries have their own culture. I don't claim to understand it. I know enough to know that there's not just one culture, there's multiple cultures, right? Even in one country, uh, depending on the religious group you're with or the ethnic group. Um, and I think that all of those groups need to determine for themselves what their societies will be. Um, I don't want America to baptize countries in, you know, with the Constitution. I, don't, I actually don't think it's possible. Um, so this idea that I'm trying to you know, impose myself on the Middle East is, is actually the opposite. I'm understanding that there's, there are essential limits to American uh, engagement, even the promotion of values in the Middle East. And the, more, the sooner we understand that, the better we'll be. Having said that, that doesn't mean that I'm going to give up uh, America's, uh, America's values. I do think we should promote them. I think we should be smarter. Uh, I think we should do it. Uh, never use hard power to promote values. It doesn't work. Um, but I think, of course, we should talk in the language with Khashoggi. I think we should have pushed much harder on the Saudis. We have all kinds of leverage. It doesn't have to be uh, through guns and bullets. There's all kinds of economic leverage, political influence that we could have brought to bear, and we didn't. And I think that's a travesty. I wouldn't say in the name of Saeed that we should just let everybody do what they're going to do because we don't want to be the white savior. We're white. I am. We're a Western. We're American. We're not going to, um, you know, we're not going to apologize for that. And I think if the day we give up promoting values is the day that we cease to be America. It's actually what many people in the world look up to, even when we're hypocritical. Thanks. Yep. Hi, my name is Kelsey Ritchie, and I'm from the University of Texas, um, study counterterrorism and radicalization. Um, my question kind of combines two of your recommendations of fixing the domestic narrative and then really kind of bumping up our soft power initiatives. So I think that in a lot of the big issues the United States has faced in foreign policy, we've always been fighting an ideology, whether it was Nazi nationalism or Soviet communism, and now we're in this phase of Islamic extremism, and it's often been about defeating that. Um, and as far as the domestic narrative goes, oftentimes the voices that are heard the most are the ones right now that are really continuing to advocate for the defeat of that type of ideology. So when we're looking at public diplomacy in the Middle East, is there room for our diplomats to start engaging and trying to build that common ground, or do we have to wait until the domestic narrative has already changed at the top policy-making levels? Uh, I'll give you the, the lawyer's answer, both and, right? I mean, I think that I think we should start with the, the public diplomacy, ramp it up in the Middle East as soon as possible, tomorrow if we can. Um, it, will, it will be twice as effective, three times, four times more effective if we're actually doing it in Arabic or in Persian or whatever, whatever language uh, the country speaks. Um, it's, it's unfortunate that 90% of our diplomats uh, are speaking, when they're making public statements, are speaking in English and there's subtitles at the bottom. You miss all kinds of things. You miss the sincerity of a presentation. So I think the sooner we can get people up to speed on languages, uh, the sooner we can uh, repair some of the messages, uh, we should start immediately. Uh, having said that, though, I think the domestic, I think in, this is a thing in, in foreign policy. There was a great piece in Foreign Affairs, and I forget who wrote it. This was maybe four or five months ago, that made exactly this point on the domestic narrative. It's really, Americans want to know, why do we do what we do in the world? Okay, now we know at the end of the day, a small group of people who live in Washington, D.C., uh, make these decisions, but the American people, you know, in a democracy, foreign policy will only uh, go so far without the support of the people. And you can't make any big moves in the world without, without the people. And so I think the Americans... Uh, that I know are curious, like, what are we doing in the Middle East? What are we doing in Afghanistan? Why are we doing this and not this or that and not? So I think that there's a lot of work that needs to be done. It needs to be done in a simple way. It needs no, uh, and this is Trump's genius, whether you like him or not. He just knows how to speak to the common person in language they understand. Why is it in my interest as a guy from Toledo, Ohio, to be involved in Iraq, for example? And somebody needs to make the case to them, and I don't think Republicans or Democrats have done a good job so far. That's a whole field of study, I think, that needs to grow. 
Thank you. My name is Brian Smith, and my question is sort of a follow-up, but it, it, it also speaks to this. Uh, well, thank you. Uh, I could just speak without the microphone. But the, you, you mentioned um, the question of how a secular administration is going to speak religious language in, in you know, a diplomatic context. Um, I'm sort of thinking in terms of, of, the, of the domestic narrative, perhaps uh, more familiar to the religious right as it's you know, so-called, uh, this, this sort of eschatological narrative about the Middle East yeah. and this kind of prophetic millennial dimension that you, 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 you still hear about. Yep. And um, you know, how, the question, how does a secular administration speak religious languages when they actually internalize it? And we get this kind of, you know, these statements by, by George Bush or even like people, I mean, going further back, you have, you know, Saddam Hussein and the Ayatollah, you know, they're all sort of legitimizing their, their mission in some sort of eschatological narrative. You, you mean American leaders? All, it's, oh, it's everyone. in the yeah, Middle yeah. East. Yep. And, and it's almost like perhaps we're not, we haven't been so much facing a clash of civilizations as a, as a, as a sort of a clash of eschatologies. And you know, how, how do you see that that, hmm. that that narrative still has life and it still has some kind of, of salience in, in you know, whether it's the moving of the, of the embassy to, to Jerusalem, whatever, it's all this, it, I, I feel like this is still alive and I'm wondering how that plays out on the ground. Thank you. That's a big, big question. Your, my answer will not be satisfying, I promise. Um, it's, you know, Walter last year gave a talk, and I think he touched on some of it this morning, on the substratum of eschatological thinking in American public life and American foreign policy. And he talks about post-millennial versus pre-millennial. Um, there's something there. We, even if we're not believers, we've internalized a lot of what uh, this theological language has taught us. You know, there is a positive end of history, we just need to work there, or the end of history is gonna be terrible and we need to prepare for the end of the world. Um, you may not realize that you're thinking in those terms, but chances are you are, many Americans do. Are things getting better or worse? That's all eschatological. Um, in the Middle East, it's the same. A you know, Abrahamic religions, um, they are historical. They think about beginnings, middles, and ends. You know, they. They are teleological. They're oriented toward particular uh, uh, ends. And I think that uh, it crops up in Islam, in Judaism, and in Christianity, and you're not going to get away from it. I think it's unhelpful if it's working its way into your uh, policy. Uh, you know, I don't, I don't support any president, uh, you know, referencing uh, Armageddon or Gog and Magog and none of that. That's not. Um, but the fact of the matter is, in the Middle East, certainly among the bad actors of the Middle East, uh, the, you know, the sort of the secular-ish autocrats, Bashar al-Assad, they, they don't talk like that. But when you get to some of the people who are really sort of mucking it up, uh, ISIS, bin Laden, all, uh, Iran, they very much uh, believe in these things. And it may not be that the whole society does. In fact, certainly in the case of Iran, maybe the majority of the society does not. But in terms of the main line of the government, um, they, they do. They preach that. They're waiting for the return of the Mahdi. So what do you do with that? Uh, I think the first, really, the, the only point I would make, the first and last point, is you need to recognize that. Um, you know, Graham Wood did a great piece about ISIS um, in the Atlantic, this was probably now two years ago, where he broke down, you should probably read it, like what these people actually believe. And I think for a lot of, you know, beltway wonks, and I'm, I'm, if you're here, uh, I apologize, but um, it, it, it's sort of like you don't believe it. Like, really? Come on. These guys, they don't really believe it. No, they really do believe that. And I think that... Um, there's no, there's, no, um, there's no real response, certainly not a canned response, but you need to understand that these people, many of these people, are just not rational actors. And so as you're creating responses to them, you know, you know, there's this sort of famous thing where, you know, the problem with ISIS is that people just don't have jobs, right? Well, there's probably some of that, but the people who sort of founded ISIS and lead it, they're very much operating in terms of ideology. And so as you're crafting policy responses, military responses, you need to understand that at the end of the day, this is an idea, it's not even a rational idea, and there's only so much that we can do in the realm uh, of sort of brute force that's going to change that. So uh, I don't know that that's, that's not a silver bullet, but you have to sort of know that that's the case. And by the way, that when large numbers of Americans, probably tens of millions of Americans, maybe, I don't know, hundreds of millions, who knows, 
uh, actually subconsciously or consciously see the world in similar terms also. So while people you know, working in two capitals may be very secular, they may be sort of making all kinds of calculations about what the other is going to do and crafting policy based on that to counter and to counter again, um, the populations that they represent are seeing the world in much starker, even Manichaean terms. And so um, it's, it's, it's just a reality, again, that I don't think uh, U.S. policy is really equipped to handle. Beyond that, it's hard to... Well, I mean, look, if, you, if your argument is that moving the U.S. Embassy to Jerusalem was part of some apocalyptic thing, I don't think you... It, well, there are people that, sure, think you need to be careful about what messages you're telegraphing to the world, for sure. But at the end of the day, just because somebody's going to interpret me doing X, Y, or Z in some kind of apocalyptic way doesn't mean that I shouldn't do it, right? I mean, but, it, but you, do need to be, you do need to be aware. That's all I can say. Thank you, everybody. I appreciate your patience. Enjoy the rest of the conference.